Hello, hello. Welcome to the Japan Zoomina. It's Japan 23rd, 2024, 4 p.m. in San Diego, which makes it 7 p.m. on the East Coast, and January 24th, 2024, in Japan. Ohayou gozaimasu. I'm Ulrika Shada, and I, my guest today is uh, Rick Katz. We're going to talk about his brand new book, The Contest for Japan's Economic Future. Before we start, let me give you a little bit of background um, about us. So uh, as I just mentioned, this is the Japan Zuminar, and I'm a professor and the director of the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology at UC San Diego. Um, this event finds you at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We have a large number of faculty and many more students. We have eight degrees, and one of them is uh, a Master's of International Affairs with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our offerings, please visit gps.ucsd.edu. And JFIT is our Japan Center. We're having a lot of fun uh, doing things connected to Japan and San Diego and the United States of America. And uh, you can find us uh, at jfit.ucsd.edu. Our events are recorded. Um, and that means two things. One, you, you will not be seen on this recording uh, even when you write a question into the Q&A box during this event, which uh, you are invited to do. I will refer to you only by your first name to protect your privacy. The recording also means that we have a library of past events called the Jay-Z Gallery. And you can find links to these past events at jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zoomino. We have upcoming events. Of course, uh, Rick is here today. I'll introduce him momentarily. Next week, um, because we had an entrepreneurship session last time, I'm going to have Rick today. Last week, I thought, let's talk to an angel investor and um, and a person who actually does these things rather than write about them. And so we'll have our very own Takaki Oizumi uh, talking about health sciences innovation in Japan. Um, all of these are tentative titles, by the way. Followed uh, on February 20th uh, by Anne Van Bell, who's uh, with a capital group. And she's going to talk about Japan uh, uh, from an investor's point of view over the years. Uh, followed by Peter Gruss, who will uh, take us back to innovation. He is a uh, former head of a Max Planck Institute in Germany and the uh, uh, founding president of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And we'll talk about R&D funding and university education towards innovation in Japan. That's on March 6th. And on March 19th, uh, we'll have Albert Chu, who works for uh, the digital lab at Sompo Insurance. And we're going to talk about the future of insurance, not just insure techs and the DX, but also um, aging societies and what insurers can do uh, in light of demographic change. So that's all very exciting. And I hope you will join us in the future. So with all of that, enough of me. Let me introduce uh, Rick, who's here. Uh, Rick, hello. Hello in New York. Hello from Tokyo to New York. Um, congratulations on the publication of your book. It's actually not the first time you're on the Japan Zoomina. We had you uh, a while back when the book was, I think, in design stage. And now it's here, so it's fantastic. So Rick is, um, has a, holds a BA from Columbia University and an MA from NYU, both in economics. He um, has been a lecturer at Stony Brook SUNY and an adjunct uh, professor at, at NYU Stern Business School. He is known uh, for running the Oriental Economist and writing for the Oriental Economist for a long time, as, as well as Toyo Keizai online. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. And uh, he has his own Substack blog, which I highly recommend. And he is also the author of uh, uh, two books. Um, the, the one that is probably in most people's mind is The System That Soured, uh, which was published in 1998, just a, just a month before uh, the banking crisis uh, popped in, in Japan. And, and I think uh, Ricky just mentioned it was also a homage to, uh, to Kozo Yamamura, who, who wrote a who wrote a book called The Success That Soured, but that's a different book, right? So The System That Soured. All right, Rick, we're going to talk about the contest for Japan's future. And so welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, the book actually began when I had lunch with Professor Hugh Patrick, who asked me a question that just gnawed at me. So many years later, this is my very long-winded answer to his very short question. And it's kind of a good news bad news, good news story. And the good news 
is that it really would not, in my view, take very much change in Japan for Japan to have a really solid economic recovery. Its problems are not something deeply embedded in the national psyche or national culture. They're the result of various kinds of practices and patterns and institutions and behaviors that made a lot of sense when they were adopted. But times changed, and those practices did not change with them. People created those practices. People can change them. That's the good news. The bad news is in a one-party democracy and the dominance of, of decades-old giant corporations, the Japan's political and economic leadership have really refused to make the necessary changes. The good news responding to that is that because of the kind of generational and technological and other sorts of changes going on in Japan, I truly believe that Japan has got the best opportunity that it's had in a generation to have a really solid economic recovery. Now, I'm going to focus on just one aspect of, the re of that recovery, which is the resurrection of the kind of entrepreneurship that Japan had uh, that really drove the, uh, I'm going to move to share screen, so hold on a second, that drove the um, rapid modernization in the Meiji era, and that also uh, drove really the, the post-war economic miracle. All right now, so let us see. Let's move on here. Here we go. Next. All right. Is that is that working? Is it in my screen? The thing is too hot. The tight line is too high. Is it okay in yours? Yeah, it's uh, look, look, looking good. Go for it. Okay, good. All right. So when the government of Japan thinks about reform, what it mostly talks about is corporate governance reforms in the big publicly listed companies on the stock market. And while that's absolutely necessary, it's really, in my view, woefully insufficient. First of all, you know, the 5,000 largest companies in Japan employ less than 10% of the workforce. So without, a without the other 90%, you're not going to have the kind of productivity revolution that Japan needs. Worse than that, giant age-old companies very often in every country suffer from the old company disease, which is... They become very set in their ways. They find it hard even to recognize that times have changed, let alone, even if they do, be able to make the necessary changes. And it's worse in Japan because the lifetime of system promotion from within tends to promote people with the same ideas. So take, for example, electronics, which was a spectacular success for Japan. Only one, one of the top two dozen electronics hardware manufacturers only one was born after 1959. So these are very, very old companies. And that in the back in between 2008 and 2020, at a time when global demand for electronics was soaring, of the top 10 Japanese electronics hardware companies, every single one suffered falling global sales. So that's the problem with these old companies. And what you need is a healthy balance between these older companies and entrepreneurs with fresh ideas. Partly some of these entrepreneurs will replace the older companies and partly they'll get them to up their game. Like Tesla has got the older companies moving to electronic vehicles. In the United States, for example, in the 1980s, 1990s, 60% of the productivity growth in manufacturing came from firms that were under five years of age. So every country needs a balance between the giants and the entrepreneurs, but Japan is skewed toward the giants, toward the incumbents, as well as the moribund SME, the moribund among the SMEs. And there really discriminates against newcomers. Now, let me be clear about what I mean about entrepreneur, because when you say entrepreneur, a lot of people have in mind the Silicon Valley model. But this is a very small sliver of entrepreneurship. These are companies which are start small. Some of them become skyrockets. There's about 2,000 high-tech companies in, a, in Silicon Valley. Yet in the US as a whole, among what the OECD classifies as high-growth SMEs, and they nickname them gazelles after the African antelope, there are 50,000 of these companies. And maybe they grow from 20 people to 100 or from 50 people to 500 but they drive so much of the dynamism in the country. 
And it, you see in Europe and Asia, there are 10 to 20,000 of them. We don't know how many in Japan because the Japanese government does not consider this important enough to measure. But here's what we do know, that if you take the male labor force, and I use that because of the big gender gap in Japan, if you take the founders of companies with non-family employees, Japan has the lowest share in the entire OECD. The median share is 6% of that population in Japan is two and a half. Worse than that, when the Japanese companies don't grow because of the obstacles to growth. So they start off with around the same level of, of people, employees as other companies, they don't, they don't grow. Uh, you can see the, the little thing for Japan at the end here. Okay, good. Now, here is the way that societal changes are changing these impediments. So one of the big impediments was because of the lifetime employment, it was hard for newcomers to get experienced staff. That's changing. Today, talented employees are far more willing to switch firms than their parents to take the risk. Women who cannot get promoted very well at traditional firms are flocking to these startups. And in fact, there's so much of this churn that Japan's newest billionaire, Suichiro Minami, created a site, a website that will marry, matchmake companies that need employees and company and job people who would like to switch jobs to have a better opportunity. There are 20,000 companies which over the last 10 years have used this company to hire people. And there are 2.3 million job switchers who earn at least 6 million yen per year, which is at today's low rate, about 40,000 per year who have used this web to switch jobs. That's just one company. And there are lots of these companies. So as a result of this change in the generational attitude, 70% of the firms now have to engage in mid-career hiring, and which is double what it was 30 years ago. Now, the other issue uh, that is really driving change is technology. I'm sorry. Here we go. When you have technology has an incredible power to change the power balance within society. And when you have a new dominant technological era, you need new business institutions. So in the analog era, which forged today's corporate giants in Japan, it was the innovation was led by giant cash rich, vertically integrated companies. Most of the R&D was done by firms with at least 25,000 employees. This is all over the all over the development. They did everything in house, soup, soup to nuts, the whole thing. They didn't collaborate with other people. The digital era is a totally different business model where so much of innovation is led by entrepreneurs and not only and collaboration, not only collaboration amongst entrepreneurs, but collaboration between entrepreneurs and the giants. So for example, more and more of the R&D is done by companies with fewer than 1,000 staffers rather than more than 25,000. There's a trend called open innovation, which is collaboration. So in digital technology, information and communications technology, the average number of comp different companies cooperating to produce a patent was 219, many of them across borders. The Pfizer vaccine was not invented by Pfizer. It was invented by a German startup that was created by a married couple who are immigrants from Turkey. So it's a globalization story as well as an entrepreneurship story and collaboration story. Japan, on the other hand, is stuck in the past. So you have digi the digital technology, which is needed for everything from making cars to small retail stores to brain surgery in a ranking of 64 countries in what they call digital agility, which is how much do they increase profits and sales for every dollar they invest in digital technology, Japan came in dead last, 64th out of 64. One of the reasons for this lack of entrepreneurship and the lack of this kind of innovative R&D is that 90% of the government aid to R&D in Japan goes to the larger firms. And as a result, you see over here in these European countries, 30% or more of the R&D is done by firms with less than 500 employees. The US, 17%. Germany, 15%. Japan, it's only 7%. Now, 
this technological thing is making a really big change in the balance of power. So for example, digital technology is more important, more and more important to a car. So the Toyota group, which lacks the in-house talent to do this digital technology, has had, had to hire independent software vendors, both Japanese and outsiders. And they now have, as their first tier suppliers, more of these independent vendors than the hardware parts makers. And these companies do not want to join the Keiretsu of Toyota. They want to remain independent. They want to be able to collaborate with Toyota's, Toyota's competitors and collaborate with people in other industries. And so what happens is big business is now conflicted. On the one hand, it needs enough newcomers that it can have as partners, but it doesn't want so many that will supplant the dominance and certainly does not want the kind of challengers that would put them out of business. And that is part of what the, that the politics, I think, will begin to change as the business groups become quite ambivalent about what it is they really want. Now, e-commerce has also changed the power balance. One of the biggest obstacles to, the, to newcomers was the traditional distribution system run by incumbents, which was really a bottleneck. But now with e-commerce, you can get your customers. So in Rakuten alone, it's got 57,000 small and medium enterprises who've got yearly sales now of 5.7 trillion, which is 40 billion at today's exchange rate. It would have been you know, more like 50 or 55 billion a couple of years ago, but that's the way it is. Some have grown tenfold, 20-fold, even 100-fold after joining these e-commerce networks. There's also a globalization trend. One of the most interesting things that I found in talking to these founders, so many of them have global experience. Either they studied abroad or they worked abroad or they worked for a foreign company in Japan. In the interest of time, I'm going to run through, not bypass more of this, but globalization is also a key change driver. So the remaining big obstacle besides politics is finance which is it's very, very hard, unless you're rich yourself, it's very hard to start a high growth company. Uh, most companies start with what are called business angels, which are to serve companies that are smaller than venture capital companies serve, and they don't they're not intend to become giant companies. And these are called business angels and they have funds, but there are very few of these funds in Japan, partly because the tax system is biased against them, and for other reasons. And then by the time they reach a growth stage, because banks don't lend to a startup, but they do lend when you're five or 10 years old, the banks don't lend, want to lend to those they consider younger companies. And actually Ulrich has written a lot on this stuff. They don't want to lend to female founders, especially. And in fact, a bank will charge a 10 year old company with a good credit rating, two percentage points higher interest than they'll charge a 50-year-old company with a poor credit rating that they've been dealing with for decades. They don't do cash flow projections. They rely upon collateral, the personal guarantee. And what's the result? Two results. One is, if you've got more brains than money, you're not going to be able to create a company. And that's why the sh one reason why the share of entrepreneurs in Japan was so low in that initial chart. But the second thing is companies that don't start off big enough, that can't grow. I'm sorry, I forgot to turn this off, uh, the sound off. That, that companies that, that can't grow because they don't have external credit, they will invest less, they will grow less, they will die sooner. And you know, so this is lack of finance is I think the single biggest obstacle. And on the other hand, the government spends more than 10% of GDP either giving credit guarantees or direct governmental loans to many of these SMEs, which are kind of disguised welfare for people who've retired or zombies. And what happens in every country, the fewer inferior firms that die, the less room there is for new superior firms to replace them. And you'll see this graph, it's quite a clear relationship. And here's Japan. So what should Tokyo do? Well, the interesting thing is that there are so many experts in Japan who know exactly what should be done. I doubt that I've come up with a single original idea about what should be done. I've taken it all from these brilliant experts in Japan. And when Kishida said, 
oh, I'm going to create 100,000 new startups, glorious, you know, gung-ho startups by 2027, and venture capital is going to grow tenfold by 2027, and I'm going to do bold things. Every time they say bold, you know, nothing's going to happen. I'm sorry, my, my sarcasm. So what happened was he didn't, they had the science council within the cabinet office produce this superb report written by themselves and by outside experts. And he should have virtually ignored it. And so the one thing that he did was he pretended to create a tax break for angel funds. Now, this is very, very interesting because France was 20 years ago, very much like Japan, considered anti-entrepreneurial. In fact, there was a story, which is not true, that George W. Bush was said to have said, France is so anti-entrepreneurial, they don't even have a word for entrepreneur in their language, where, of course, entrepreneur is a French word. Bush actually did not say that, but that was the image. What the government did was they created a big tax break for middle-class people to invest $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 in an angel fund. And as a result, there are now 40,000 new startups, about 2,500 of them in really deep, deep tech. In 2010, their total value was about $10 billion. Now it's almost $300 billion. They're growing unicorns much more than Japan. France did not stop being France. They're still French. All they did was they took some practical measures. What Keish should have said is you can't invest in a fund. You invest in an individual company. Well, why would you, I mean, why would a person who's not an expert risk their money in an individual company when most of them fail? They prevented it from uh, uh, investing in funds. In fact, a lawyer friend of mine, I did an article on this. He passed it on to Miyazawa, who was head of the tax commission. Had no impact, unfortunately. Um, the government does a lot of procurement. Uh, 20% of GDP is procurement by the government. They could set aside procurement from new firms, innovative new firms. They promise to do 3% of their procurement from new firms. They don't even reach that goal. There are many other measures. I don't want to go on too long. So let me stop here and we can begin the, the dialogue. So thank you very much. That's terrific. Rick, if you can, you want to take those the share off? That would be no, so people can see us. Excellent. Okay, great. There we go. All right. So, uh, so thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I want to. So we have a full house, and then not everybody knows it. But let me just announce Whoa. that we've known each other for over three decades, and so this is going to get a little bit back and forth here. We I'm first met just time. after my book came out. That's right. So, so let me give you a hard time on this. I mean, sort okay. of uh, in the in the interest of intellectual uh, uh, quarreling, right? Um, very good. So, so the. You started us out saying that, you know, in, in the United States, the large firms, when they're done, they're done. And then therefore they make room for the small firms, a typical creative uh, destruction story. And I would like to challenge that a little bit um, and see what see what you have to say. On well, that. maybe so, more than a little bit. Sorry? Yeah, a little bit. Well, maybe okay, more I'm than a little bit. Part. Okay, let me go for it. So, um, so when when the um, some of us may be old enough to remember when when Panasonic and Sony showed up in the United States with their very uh, nifty uh, TVs and and tape recorders and whatnot, uh, the U.S. electronics industry was wiped out. Uh, RCA, in particular, which was basically America's Toshiba at the time, uh, a very very high powered R and D place, and and Zenith and a bunch of other. Uh, companies that you may remember better than 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 I do, were all wiped out. They they, they went back up. As a result uh, of their bankruptcy, the United States today finds itself without companies that can build infrastructure for five G. Uh, Lucent uh, later on was spun out of ATT and went also went bankrupt. So so the United States doesn't have a base, and some of the technologies that would have flown out of uh, survival of those companies in those R&D places. Meanwhile, Sony and Panasonic, when, this is basically a repeat of the same story, right? When Samsung arrived, Sony and Panasonic had the exact same problem that RCA and Zenith had when, when Japan arrived, right? And so um, the Japanese system, long, insert long story here, how that worked, but in any event, Sony, uh, for example, was allowed to 
um, go go through ten years uh, without without profit, and uh, the markets were patient enough to allow that. The newly emerging Sony, I mean, in the meantime, Sony and Panasonic have still employed four hundred thousand people. I actually looked at this right. So for ten years, four hundred thousand people were employed, and Sony is of course still bringing a lot of joy and happiness to all the users of PlayStation, uh, of which there are many around the world, right? So there's, there was cash flow, there was always cash flow, that's good. And uh, Sony is now emerging as a quiet leader in CMOS technologies and sensors and vision sensors and, and you know, long story there. So your story of creative destruction is, let's just kill these old guys, make room for little guys, and then we get a growth in the little guys. The Japanese story of innovation is, um, well, it will take time. It's slower. It's not as sexy. Sorry to use that word on a public forum, but I mean, that's the new word, right? It's not as exciting. It's not as shiny and, and, and glitzy and whatnot. Uh, and yet at the end of it, we slug through this. We actually not only have, do we have these companies and the employment, but we have domestic technologies in, an, in a field that actually given decoupling right now. So pretty uh, important. I mean, the, part of the US problem is that we do not have these technologies in the US. And so we're dependent on other countries to build our communication systems. What do you say? Okay, I think you, uh, uh, my story is actually different from what you described. What I described was, was this, there is creative destruction in other words, it has to be possible. In many, many cases, when there's a new technology, a new company does replace an old company. And this happens around the world. And that's the nature of, in a rapidly moving field, the, 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 before the Japanese arrived, the companies that were dominant in radios were not dominant in black and white TVs. And the companies that were dominant in TVs were not in PCs. And, and they're, they're not dominant in, in other things, right? Uh, Japanese did wipe out the memory market, but Intel moved to larger chips. NVIDIA is, is very, very strong in a chips for AI. Now, what can happen is the entrance of disruptive challengers can cause two possible outcomes. They can grow and replace the old companies that cannot adapt, or they can, in, in situations where there's contestable markets, the old guys can up their game because of the challenge. The only reason why Ford and VW and GM are producing electric vehicles is because Tesla, which by the way, got part of its start from US government money, lest people forget, right? Um, Not. Because Tesla pushed them to up their game, right? Sony is, an, is and now the challenge from China is finally getting, I hope, the Japanese automakers to recognize the importance of being capable in EVs. So that it's not that, uh, now you say the US has no capability in, in 5G. There are all sorts of areas of electronics, but that's a big industry with lots of different fields. It is not required that the United States or any other country be supreme in every single field. But there are tons of fields in electronics where the US is supreme. The PlayStation. Well, can I just, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I just stop you? So, so this is sure, go ahead. This is exactly the point because uh, the reason. So, so in my story, if you if you pushed it to the extreme, the reason we have a trade war with China is Huawei, and that we were dependent on Huawei power uh, things, right? So, but I completely agree. Not every country has to be good at everything, and so by that same token, why are we always talking about Japan not being good at software rather than talking about Japan being excellent at hardware, right? Well, I mean, so, so Japan doesn't have to be good at everything that the United States is good at. And so if we compare the two countries, wouldn't we then want to say, okay, so the United States is not good at building cell phone towers or whatever that is, antennas, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and Japan is very good at that. So uh, uh, bingo, problem solved. Uh, these two no, no, problem not, problem not solved. Problem is, it's not simply that the Japanese, for, for historical reasons, are not good at software. This is not a brain deficiency. They're, you know, business yeah. history reasons why they're not. It's there's a disdain in a certain in certain corporations about software because hardware is what's real, right? And and the point is that the the people who run these companies and they have electronic electrical engineers pretending to be software engineers, 
that they don't know how to, they don't understand the software. They use software sometimes to automate tasks they're already doing really than, than re-engineer the company. And as a result, even when they invest in this digital software, as I said, they come in 64th out of 64 countries in how much benefit they get from this digital technology, which is a combination of hardware and software. So operational efficiency, operational efficiency is great, but it's not sufficient to be a company. And when you have the top 10 Japanese electronics companies losing sales, declining sales at a time when demand for products is growing, that's a problem. And Sony, the reason Sony lost profits is because they didn't realize it was time to move on from TVs. That very, was very true, right? So Sony, Sony missed thing. that. No, no, no discussion. Sony made a mistake. But mistakes are, you know, we're human, so we make mistakes. That's, that's okay. Well, no, but, is, then, there, but is, it, is it a mistake or is it a certain mindset and, and a promotion from within sociology? If you're a sensei, if you're, if you're a senior senpai, you know, promoted this product, and you say abandon the product, you feel like you betrayed them. There are certain reasons, some mistakes are just mistakes, but some things are systemic problems. And I think some of these things are systemic problems. And, and to have new people come in and shake up the system, it will, in some cases, it will destroy companies that should go. In other cases, the companies will collaborate with them. Like I mentioned the case of Toyota, they'll up their game, they'll respond to the competition. Sony found a different way to go, so it's still around, right? You need these giants, but are they setting the tune? You need this combination, the healthy balance. Japan okay. puts the balance. All right, so you just said exactly what I wanted you to say, which is you need these giants. So let's talk about the title of the book because I promised everybody that I would give you a hard time on the title, okay? So um, uh, I, I, the contest to me, um connotes a zero-sum game that is that there's a battle and the battle for japan's future sort of thing right that's your that's the book title uh between small and large firms gazelles and elephants as you put it uh, and that's very interesting i had to think about this for a bit and um you know the way the way i look at this is that first of all it's not a zero-sum game right so the more the merrier the positive network effects, which you've just mentioned with toyota and so forth right so it, it it's it shouldn't be a contest it should be a synergy space um and it's not as if if the old guys remain the young guys can't do it which you seem to say though um and it's not as if if the young guys pop up the old guys have to go i think in an ideal system um you know if you think about it the the, the large companies have everything that the little companies need they have the money the people the the equipment the machinery all of that the little guys have the speed the ideation the uh, uh, break it, fix it sort of mentality, right? That the old guys don't have. So in an ideal space, they would come together. They, so they would they would eat, kind of get each other going. But you seem to be thinking of it as a contest. So mm -hmm. why don't you explain the title to us? Okay, there's nothing seems about it. I that doesn't seem. I am <laughs> because it's a political contest. Because what? Because all of these giants or many of these giants. They started off as gazelles. Sony was created after World War II and, and Sharp, which, I mean, all these companies and these young people who took over when the oldsters were purged. And they, there's a wonderful book on this called We Were Burning and, and the dynamism of these people. These are very exciting people. And when I meet these founders today, they want a breath of fresh air. And these are just wonderful, ambitious, talented people who want to do this stuff. And it's very, very exciting. But once these people got on top, they wanted to make sure that no one could challenge them. Imagine if IBM had had the power to prevent Intel and Microsoft from growing and from challenging them. And that's the, where the contest is. That is, that is, they need some cooperation or else they're, they're really going to be in trouble in the global competition. But they want to make sure that they stay on top. And it has to be possible for and sometimes it's necessary for the new people to disrupt and and replace the oldsters and those who it, it is a kind of the economic counterpart to natural selection in in biological evolution there is a you know genetic change and species change and some grow and some die 
but there's a political contest where the system is rigged against newcomers. The fact that the, that the government gives so much of the R&D aid to the giant companies who are flush with cash and don't need it and deny it to the others. The fact that the banking system will not lend to these newcomers. Often these banks are in, are in the same Keretsu as, as some of the other giants. The regional banks have got their own issue. But the point is that there is a policy contest and there's a belief on the part of Japan's leadership that the source of recovery will be this corporate governance reform in Japan. And suddenly the giants will see the light and do the right thing, which they have not. They hoard cash. And I'm saying that the focus will be the nurturing of the kind of entrepreneurship that drove the Meiji era modernization, that drove the post-war economic miracle. And that will create a churn and in some cases, some old companies will die and other companies will have to open their game. There'll be a, co a combination of competition and cooperation, open innovation, collaboration, uh, smaller companies doing R&D. It's a much more complex thing. Uh, I'm not describing a simplistic one-sided. What makes it a contest is that the government and the big business have acted so far to suppress the ability of someone to challenge their dominance. That's where the contest lies. It's a political contest. Very cool. Um, I, I I promised to ask you what the government can do, but let me keep that until the very end. We have a full house and people are uh, coming up with a lot of questions and I want to share some of those questions. Sure. Um, we've got- oh, Let's uh, go another half hour. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, we've got Ray. Uh, Ray has two questions. Uh, the one is um, about society and culture and whatnot. And do you really think that uh, the Japanese, or do you think that 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 Japanese are still more leaders, or you know, than followers, and don't want to stick out and whatnot? How 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 does that play in? And and the second question that Ray has is, is the LDP. Um, I don't know whether you're following this in the United States, but there's this whole thing about Kishido dissolving his factions and the other faction and so forth. And so the LDP right now is mired in internal issues and may be unable to drive policy changes. And so, and if the opposition also, you know, is missing in action, do you think that um, some the, the 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 changes that you envision can happen without? political support. Okay, the answer, okay, one at a time. All right, um, the culture thing. I got a whole chapter on this. This is, you should read this book. You know what, this whole culture thing, and this I think you and I will agree on. I it's think really so. a myth. You know, a hundred years ago, why was Asia so backward? Confucianism. In the 1990s, why is Asia conquering the world? Confucianism. The 98, uh, uh, okay, Asian financial catastrophe. What caused that? Confucianism. The Japanese are followers? No. If you look, if you, you know, they did, someone did a study of comparing MBA students in Japan, India, France, and the United States. And the answers that people got to questions like, do you agree with, I like to challenge the conventional wisdom. I'm ambitious and I want to change the world. I want to uh, don't do this, that, the other thing. The answers from American and Japanese MBA students were closer to each other than either one was to the French or to the Indians. It's it's the idea of this conformism is actually a product of a promotion system that began in the 1970s, where called, called Genten Shugi, which means kind of a negative assessment, where if you did a good thing, well, you're just doing your job. But if you made a mistake, Ah, you were penalized. It began in the banks and then spread to other people. And the companies that still use it are not doing well. The companies that have abandoned it are doing poorly. And this whole, even if you look at photos of, of students at recruitment day, they used to dress conservatively, but they all dressed differently in the 80s. And then the ice age for jobs came in and all these manuals said, wear the blue suit. So they all wore the uniform. It really is a cultural myth that the Japanese themselves often believe. They've been told to believe it. They've been told who that's who they are. I do not and, believe. And by the way, Rick, yes, we completely agree on this. We completely so. agree. We, okay, we're, both, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're both Japan optimists, <laughs> right? We just have a different view of, of, of the yeah. locus of where the innovation will come from. But on these big issues, I think we're in agreement. Now, 
the second question is is really the most difficult part of, of writing this. And I got some, I, you know, Jerry Curtis said, unless you can do a political scenario by which this could all happen, no one's going to buy your book. It's just pie in the sky, right? These positive trends are really powerful. They're really important. But without amplification by government policy, for example, regarding the banks, regarding procurement, all these things that I issued, they will not reach critical mass. And they'll just be an interesting story. And, you know, uh, and Japan will again have missed an opportunity. But this is the best opportunity that they've had. Now, can it be done under the LDP? I think it can. It would be much easier if Japan had a competitive political system. But look at the changes. First of all, you have part of big business which recognizes the need for some of these changes. And then you can have a sort of a snowball effect. So for example, you have now enough entrepreneurs that get to meet with diet members, they get to meet with officials, you get all kinds of experts where the intellectual atmosphere has changed, the nemoashi of needing this kind of a change, that if you, without that change, you won't have recovery. The only reason the LDP is in power is because turnout lowers in every single election. And by default, they win, not because people like them. But they have to fear that if they don't bring about recovery, as in 2009, the opposition will get its act together and they'll lose power, right? But suppose you make some changes, for example, give more R&D aid to the smaller companies. There'll be more of them. They'll have more political clout. And so you get a mutual reinforcement of the growth of the entrepreneur numbers and weight and employment and politicians having to listen to them as an interest group and therefore making more reforms. Now, it's an uphill climb. I'm not saying it's, it's certainly not guaranteed and it is difficult, but it is more possible these days than it was 10 or 20 years ago because there has been a real growth in the number of entrepreneurs and the people that they employ and, and graduates from Keio and Todai and Wasada who would never have been entrepreneurs 10 years ago creating companies and people who will give them money. And so there are all these fantastic changes which are under the surface. So on top, Japan looks so static and moribund and awful. But underneath the surface, it, it is incredibly exciting to me. And personally, getting to meet this type of people, it was kind of new for me. And I was very, very excited, very excited to meet them. Like, yeah, it is changing, people. isn't it? I mean, it really is changing. So, so um, um, my yeah. My good colleague uh, Hans has a, has a quick clarification question, uh, which is um, you mentioned that Hugh Patrick kind of kind of got you going on this, and and so he he wanted to uh, tell us one more time what what was the question that Hugh asked you? That I didn't say what the question was. Oh. <laughs> but, I, but now I will, because I, I, I only had fifteen minutes, so I could. Yeah, the go. question was, uh, Hugh said, "Yeah, yeah, you talk about structural reform all the time." Give me 10 specific steps. If some diet member or bureaucrat said, what regulation should I get rid of or create? What tax should I get rid of or create? What budget measure should I get rid of or create? Give me five or give me 10. And I thought about it and nodded at me and nodded at me. And I'd never wanted to write another book because it was so hard, but it nodded at me. And I said, well, they, what Japan needs is contestable markets. And that's what every country needs. And to do that, it needs new companies to come about. So could I find indigenous trends going on in Japan? Because you cannot graft foreign practices onto a country. A country can adopt some things to its own, but you can't turn Japan into Sweden or America or France or whatever. It's Japan. It just should be Japan, a better Japan. And like it used to be, it did it before, can do it again. Are there indigenous trends? that are moving in this direction, which if amplified could have an effect and what measures would you need to do that? And mm -hmm. so that, that was that was how the book came about. Well, so, but it's interesting, right? You mentioned that, you just mentioned that, I mean, there is no shortage of plans on what to do. There's no shortage of lists of measures. There's no, I mean, in, in fact, there's too, too many. There's also no shortage of government funds to support this. I mean, there's money, it's, it's, all places are washing money. Uh, but but so so is it that the, we we don't have the measures or is it that there's something in the system that is and this is actually a question from from the audience. Hence the uh, contest. Yeah, politics. That's where the title is comes. Protecting from. the vested interests 
some of which are these giant companies, but a lot of which are also these, these small, moribund SMEs because there is no governmental overt social safety net. What is the safety net for people? It's their current job at their current company. So you, in order to, to avoid unemployment and welfare and stuff, you preserve these incumbent existing moribund companies rather than helping people transition from one company to another. Or you have old people in SMEs as kind of a disguised welfare system. I recognize that phrase. I think you use that phrase, right? Yeah, I, I, kind of, I, I did write that, yeah. And you were very much cited for that. It was very helpful to me. And so you have that, that a contest between those who want to shore up the incumbents. And the government says, well, we can't do an overt social safety net because we can't afford it. And I say, you can't afford not to do it because if you don't do it, you will never have the creative destruction you need to recover. And if you don't recover, how are you going to finance these aged people who do vote? And how long will you stay in power? By the lower and lower and lower turnout? The contest is the political contest between those who only want to support the giants on top and the SMEs at the bottom and those who want to help the newcomers thrive. So, um... Uh, so as I, as I mentioned, I'm in Tokyo right now, and I just had some very interesting meetings this week that basically all gel into this big, yes, it's really changing. And you mentioned the tenshoku, right? So the job changing. And um, so there's one version of the what's going to happen next sort of story, uh, which goes something like this. Uh, we've been slow for 20 years because we had we needed one generation to adapt to this idea that Lifetime employment basically is a thing of the past, and we have these job changes and so forth. It has arrived, right? So now there are more 30-year-olds that have changed the job than are still with their first employer or some, some crazy number like that. But the, 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 the thing that's popping up here and there in the conversations is that because of the labor shortage, which is actually, which has arrived, the problems that we've been talking about so far here, which which is about the small firms and the employment, and so, will actually sort of morph into this new situation where the zombie thing is basically over. We, we no longer have to go slow. We had to go slow for the last 20 years to do exactly what you just said, right? So to prepare this, this welfare system and everybody got a job and, uh, and dignity and whatnot preserved. And that's that's over because we don't have enough labor and uh, and that that is like the new horizon and i cannot i, I i'm not quite sure how to, i want to think about it is that just a new uh, excuse of why we don't have to change or is that really going to be like the big engine of a whole new you know a whole new wave i don't know so that's that's not a question that was a comment on that uh, okay i i'll think about it a little bit but my gut reaction is i don't buy it i really don't buy it Okay. Um, well, let's see. We'll have and, to come back. Also, by the way, it's not about I'm, my book is not a, sort of about small companies. It's about newer entrepreneurial companies because a lot of small companies, which will be small forever, and they're needed too. Your corner beauty shop, your drugstore, your little you know whatever. In New York, we call them bodegas, but these little tiny grocery stores. So you need them, but they don't drive dynamism. So it's new entrepreneurial, innovative companies is what I'm talking about. Um, let me, uh, yeah, that's fine. Thank you about it. We'll, we'll come back in five years and see who's right. I, I actually think this is true, and you don't, so that's great. Great, we have another reason to to meet. Um, so we have. We, I, mean, really I nice. hope you're right. <laughs> I'd like to be yeah. wrong on that. That would be nice. Um, yeah. So we have. You know, Andy wants to know. And now I, I just scrolled over Andy. It was a very good question. So I really want to ask. Oh, can you share some entrepreneurial success stories over the last ten years? How did they succeed, given the poor environment that you described, right? Given given that things are stacked against them, um, how, how did they manage to break through? That, and, okay, and, and very, anybody, very, that's a very interesting. Um, wow, let me see. Okay, I got two, two, two great stories. One is there's a guy who founded Miyamoto, who founded a company called Roxul. It's kind of an Uber for parcel delivery before Uber existed. He worked for A.T. Kearney, which is an American consulting firm. And he had some money and some friends with money. And he, he was realizing that these companies that 
did parcel delivery, they were spending a huge amount on marketing, much, much too much. He thought if you could do a website that would link the people who needed package delivered to those who, who want to buy it, that this would help. In Japan, there are three big delivery companies and 30,000 people struggling, drivers. Their trucks are only 40% full. So they don't make money. In Europe, they're 60% full. If you could raise the rate of occupancy of the truck, it would raise the income of the driver. It would make cheaper product, cheaper shipping costs, and also fewer carbon emissions. He didn't say this, I'm saying this, fewer carbon emissions per package, because you've got more packages for each mile of drive. He created this site and he got some money. He was a KO graduate. Um, he, he was one year out, of, he realized there was no company in Japan doing it. He wanted to join it, didn't exist. So he had to create it on his own, he got some money. His biggest problem was that his professional staff kept turning over. So he had to hire some veterans from larger companies. I said, you mean 50 year olds, 50 year olds, veterans? He said, no, 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 30 year old veterans who had gotten to the level say of a cut show. So, and they knew how to manage. He had a vision, but he didn't know how to manage a company. And they came in, and they solved the problem, and we haven't got time for me to tell you how, but the mission of the company. Talk to them not about money they're going to make. They want the money, too, but how this will help change Japan. The other thing is a 42-year-old community organizer in um, uh, how was the, the, uh, Tokushima, who realized there's all these food deserts in Japan, towns that have been depopulated. They can no longer support a grocery store. How are these old people who cannot drive, they're not going to walk 10 miles to buy groceries, how are they going to get food? He thought of something which the supermarkets didn't never thought of. Problem of old companies, I'm sorry. So he said, I'm going to create these trucks and I'm going to fill these trucks with 1,500 items and they're going to go from town to town and, and people can then come to the middle of town and buy what they need. And there, so he had signed up, when I spoke to him, 15 or read about it, 1,500 drivers in every prefecture. And then he was bought up by a bigger company. <clears throat> and you know it's a Japanese company because when some old lady who comes every time doesn't come, the driver will call the authorities to check on her, make sure she's not ailing. And that's how you know it's a Japanese company. But the point is the what and the the existing supermarkets never thought of this. Once someone does it, it's so damn obvious, but it took an outsider to do it. And then he created links with the supermarkets to the guys could buy items on consignment, but they don't sell, they give back and the supermarkets do with it what they will. So, but he got some initial money to start. So some people do, but there would be so much more if you actually had a, a, a serious angel funding scheme. And there's, and I've heard hearing now hearing stories unfortunately, after the book was published, about the number of entrepreneurs who go to another country because they can start a firm there more easily than they can in Japan. So the problem yeah, is- there's a, there's a huge Japan innovation bubble in Singapore, right? It was like very interesting. Um, so, so there's a certain disconnect though, uh, which, which I'm now intrigued by. Uh, between these two examples and your larger story about the electronics farms and we need startups for deep tech, right? So, so far your story has been about, we need we need a contest for deep tech. And you mentioned NVIDIA and so forth and so on. And we talked Sony. Now you're talking about what uh, what in the in the academia, this is a bad, this may sound like a bad word, it was not meant at all to be bad, like shell attack, which is, which is a bus going into the regions. Um, and and shallow tech can make a ton of money and can actually result in in deep tech changes. So it's not that this is not a bad word at all. It's just a, a way academics have decided to uh, to differentiate between uh, short runway, fast innovators getting the stuff out in in two years with a with a minimum viable product and so forth and so on versus these more like ten year biotech kind of aerospace, whatever, right, right, right. right? So, so, so far your story has been about uh, technology and technology leadership. And now the examples you're giving us though are more societal sort of, you know, maybe logistics. I mean, blockchain is gonna 
solve that problem, right? With the logistics also. So so how do you connect those two? I mean, is there is there is there something there there that that yeah the the notion most people have the notion that entrepreneur equals high tech. In fact, mm -hmm. about 16% of these innovative entrepreneurial companies are in high tech. Some of them are low tech. This guy's got a truck, right? And delivering food, but he had an idea. It's seeing a innovation is seeing a gap in the marketplace that other people don't see and seeing a solution to that gap. Now, in the US productivity revolution in the internet era, so there was no new economy. It was just using new technology with the same old economy. And in fact, most of the productivity gain was applying the new technologies to old industries. So in the example of parcel delivery, what you were using, what they had is they did not own a single truck. What they owned was a great website. So they applied the technology of software to make a traditional industry more efficient. And in fact, when the Japanese government thinks that nanotechnology and AI and all these exotic superconductivity and all these exotic things, nano or whatever, is going to solve the problem. No, it's going to use efficiency and technology and competition to take Japan's industries that are so backward by global standards and to raise them up to what our world benchmarks. It's by taking the, making the laggard industries more modernized through competition, through technology. That's what's going to create the recovery in Japan. To the, tech, the technology, the high-tech stuff, is an important part of the story. But a lot of it is how do you use this technology to revolutionize grocery stores and, as I said, part, and all sorts of transportation, all sorts of things. So it's not just in the high-tech sector per se, it's the consumers of the technology who, whose productivity will be raised by the combination of technology and competition. All right, we may have to disagree on this on 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 this idea, but so first of all, uh, I don't know what high tech is, but but I mean, so so the shallow. So when when we talk about shallow tech, we, we think about things like Airbnb or or TikTok, right, which are which are really great and they make a ton of money. But they actually, it, it doesn't take that long to launch this. You just have to have the idea, right? And and so the examples that you're giving are of that sort, and that's cool. And, you know, no, no, no question. Those those are, those are great examples, <clears throat> but they don't really quite rhyme with the sort of the destruction of of large companies and how the elephants need to go because. Um, the elephants can still coexist, which gets me back to the idea that this may or may not be a contest. I don't know, but it's very interesting, uh, Rick, as, as always. So, uh, as, as, as you know, the time is up, but we had a full house. We have over 30 questions, which I will share with you uh, so you can look at them. But but let me end on Hugh Patrick's um, uh, always wonderful question, and you know it's coming. So um, what worries you most? Uh, now that you've written the book, and the book is out, it's out there, and are things changing or changing enough? Is it politics? What's what's your what's your biggest concern? As somebody who really cares about Japan, to me, the tragedy of Japan is that it's not that hard to fix its problems. In America, we have problems that are much harder to fix, from the underclass to we all hate each other now. You know, I mean, Japan's problems are really solvable and, and it now has the opportunity that the, they were early stories about entrepreneurship is here that I thought were premature. And these people saw three swallows and said spring is here. No, but something is really happening. And to miss this opportunity again would be such a, a tragedy for a country with such potential, not to mention geopolitical importance, given the rise of China. That's what worries me is that when push comes to shove, they'll not do it. They'll get close. You can see it. You can taste it. You can feel it. And I'll do it. That's what worries me. Yeah. 
Yeah, they, it saddens me. Uh, actually, one of the one of the audience question was whether it's, this is all just an exercise of Japan to avoid uh, colonial entrepreneurial colonialism. Right? We don't want Silicon Valley sort of thing, which is which I thought was a really clever question. I don't think there's a conspiracy here, but this is really a in, so many inbuilt uh, slowdown mechanisms that that the question is. Um, and, and we'll disagree on this. I, I think the change is already here. You don't quite see it yet. So this is perfect. Uh, we can um, we can re-meet, um, you know, in, in, in maybe 36 months or so and then then look at the numbers again. So thank, thank you. you very much. Do I have one minute? I want, yeah, I'll give you one minute. One minute. Okay. Okay. First of all, uh, you wrote this really wonderful book. Uh, which we dis business reinvention, which we disagree about, and you with the whole aggregate niche strategy, and I cited that. Um, I very interesting story. So we have a different idea of who will be the focus of it. My, I talked about it. I don't think the numbers, your numbers, add up to your conclusion, but it it would be very nice if your story were true. I don't see it. But I think we should do is we should go out and do a road show together. I think it'd be very entertaining. <laughs> that would be fun. That would be fun. That would be fun. Well, let's do it. Let's uh, do it. Uh, my book is coming out in a Shinsho version in March in Japanese. So oh, uh, congratulations. We can, we can do a Japanese road show. So everybody, audience, thank you so much for showing up in great numbers. It's fantastic. Uh, clearly, this topic is one that pushes a bunch of buttons. So I will share with Rick uh, all of your questions. And do come back in two weeks from now. We'll have uh, Takaki Oizumi, who is a Japan trade uh, doctor and a health sciences angel investor. And he will take us to the ground and tell us what happens to uh, when angels invest. So um, we'll see you in, in two weeks. And until then, uh, please stay safe and be well. And thank you, Rick. It was a great thank show. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.